Phoebe, Jim, Allison, the readers, and, and hi, everyone else. Uh, who, thank you for joining us in the celebration of Holly Prado's poetry. Holly Prado was born in Lincoln, Nebraska in 1938 and died in the West Hills Hospital on June 14, 2019. She was living with me, her husband, in the villa MPTF at the time of her death. Holly loved to write. She loved American poetry, especially Wallace Stevens. She loved MPTF. She loved her family. She loved my son, Dylan. She loved the writers who work with her. She loved Coanga Press. Writing was primary to her. Holly said, I love writing. It's the deepest pleasure I know. I loved Holly with all of my heart. Prado was a member of the LA literary community since the early 1970s. Prado's work, which combines the personal and the mythic with evocative intensity, appeared in more than 100 publications and a dozen anthologies, both nationally and internationally. Alison Townsend wrote of her book, Esperanza, Poems for Orpheus, Coanga Press, 1998, in the Women's Review of Books, quote, Prado has, more than any other poet I know, the ability to capture and describe the relationship between interior and exterior worlds in a manner that is simultaneously grounded and filled with mystery, end of quote. Her 13 books published, her 13 published books include poetry, prose poetry, a novel, two novellas. She taught creative writing privately for 42 years. She also taught poetry in the Master of Professional Writing program at USC for 20 years. She was awarded a certificate of recognition from the city of Los Angeles in 2006 for her work in the literary community. The distinguished readers are, in order of appearance, James Cushing, Phoebe McAdams, me, Harry Northup, and Allison Townsend. We begin with a reading from Holly's book-length poem, Weather, Coanga Press, 2019. She wrote the second half of it while living in the villa. James Cushing will introduce the book and then read from it. And then after he reads, Phoebe will follow him and then me, and then uh, Allison will read from her other poetry. Here's James Cushing. Thank you, Harry. The last time I saw Holly Prado, whom I'd known for 40 years, we were part of a group performance of Song of Myself at Beyond Baroque and in Venice. And now, today, we have a reading from her experiment in the long poem, Weather, a single book-length poem in the larger tradition of Whitman's personal epic, presenting an account of a voyage that lasted from fall 2015 to fall of 2018 through the inner seasons of a mythically conscious woman's Los Angeles. In a more specific tradition though, Prado's work is in the line of Diane Wachowski, Anais Nin, Diane De Prima, Lynn Hijanian, the recent Nobel Prize winner, Louise Glick, and other women who have written with wisdom and courage about their reson resonantly and resolutely three-dimensional inner lives. It is sad that Weather is Prado's last book, but a mere compensation for me is it is her best. Farthest and deepest in reach, a modernist collage orchestrated by an expressive hand. The poem is open enough to be entered virtually anywhere, yet organically shaped by a mature mythic awareness to have narrative momentum and coherence. Prado's work makes the promise that all real poetry makes, that our veil of pursuits be lifted and that we see some of the wild truth around us and within us. Harry has asked me to begin the reading 
with um, a, uh, a section of whether, uh, if any of you have the book around or, or with you or would like to read along with me, uh, I'll be reading from pages 53 through 57. Um, uh, if you don't have the book in your personal library, well, there is a hole in your personal library and this is what will fill it. And the book is available for $20 and I'll be able to say, you know, how you can, you can uh, acquire it uh, at, at the end. Weather, year two, part one, October 2016, December 2016. This is called profusion. One, today's O in October, the wheel of the year is picking up speed, exactly like two skinny boys outside the window, short sleeve white t-shirts, over long jeans, their ages, the time when nothing quite fits. They're caught on the wheel, just as I am, as all of us are in our weather's terse blue. This lunar month for old Celts marked the dream veil's quick thinning. Gort, which is ivy, opens the door, then twines at its closure. Be careful. We've entered Hecate's landscape. It's never full light, never straight fact. Wait until midnight, then use her black pen to write her a note. Sign it with darkest respect. Two, last October was anger and loss. Today, all the pumpkins have come to the stores. Orange, the O of profusion. Year's harvest is roundness. Fat circles to show us we always return, knowing how little space can exist between Earth and its crows who rush toward our dead. Dead who can read what we send in the beats. My password some days is solemn. And some days, it's one long blank sigh. Some days I pour myself out. Most nights, I recall that the ancients hid their bare faces from horror, from Hecate's death-giving mood. Persephone is drugged, is dragged once again to the underworld, to Hades. Her husband, god of all souls, where she reigns as soul goddess eating red pomegranates. The red is an unlit version of color, invitation to stare, wonder what souls really look like, if this isn't it. I believe that it is, the roundness, the wheel, an inside packed full of seeds, which any soul knows is the start of what's coming to birth. Don't worry, mysteries have their conclusions, which aren't ever answered. Gravity, weakest of forces, does hold us in place. Even the crows, sleek and bombastic, settle onto phone wires above me, say they need angels to help with their messenger work. I can't summon those forces but I can locate candles, which angels adore. So then I do buy orange candles along with pale brown ones, like cinnamon sticks. I remember my friend who wished for a magical life. She died young. After some years, I dreamed her. Andrea waited across a broad river for great celebration. She'd become queen of Halloween. We'd simply worship her power to enchant. Why am I sure that dreaming redeems what we need? Because I would rather believe than to give in to fang hiss 
to a shudder brought with the winds, our ghost Santa Annas. Give in to our fear that the unknown is blasphemous, horrid, a bony sharp fingernail scratching against our safe door. The unknown is only tomorrow, which does understand who you are, what you deserve, what you can't live without. You will keep living until your last day. Then you'll join what you've wished for. No, of course I can't prove it. Three, October 12th. The moon visits our window. She's heading toward full. In another three nights, we'll have round and spectacular moonlight, which wakes me, then sends me to sleep once again. A kind moon, non-glaring, intelligent brightness, offering comfort in spite of the world's broken song. Yes, she can bring destruction, controller of tides, but not at this single moment when arrival means waking in bed, seeing this moon through the window. We can depend on the moon and on the seasons. In this shaky October, political rancor, anniversaries recalling horrible breakups, a friend unable to see, everyone's knees giving out, my collection of scarves collapsing in colors strong ruin. The whole point is this, with Earth's tectonic plates shifting beneath us, we still can rely on lunar arrangement, on something alert in the dark. One house in sunlight, the next house is covered with shadow. I go into the kitchen, think only of feeding myself. Here are the pears, then there are eggs. One high school friend voted the hair and the walk in our senior year. Lived in a house with her parents, a house where she had her own bathroom. That's wealth, I believed. That's what you have if you're rich. I never had that, which now has no meaning at all since Carol is dead. Wealth grants some pleasures, but nothing like brown, ripe, bosque pears, or like musing on crows, crows who are yapping a lot in the street right behind me. They see into their crowness, what we yearn for with mantras, sincere meditation, religious retreats. We try, bless our hearts. Crows stare into themselves without sin, take what they've got, fly it up to the souls who are waiting for them. This year I've lost three women to death, Maud Ann, my cousin Jean, Carolyn C., whose writing life mattered. Maud Ann gave me a couple of secrets. Jean was a sister. Carolyn wrote about Harry's day when Swall Press magazines were given their due. Editors talking and talking, Carolyn writing it down, getting her article into our LA Times, which never attends to the poets right here, doing more work for the city than anyone knows. The poets are crows. Poets handle the angels with deft claw and sparkle. Four. Midday, I sit on the bed clearing my mind, but I fail at this clean, simple practice. The truth, I love thinking. I sit on the bed waiting for Harry and groceries. When I hear the door open, I give over to putting away cartons of milk, fresh salad greens, the frozen skinny cow bars that I love. I love chocolate, thinking and chocolate. Five, Marvin Smallheiser has died. At his funeral, there was a rabbi. There were his students, 
In the past, I was among them, who at his gravesite performed his beloved Tai Chi. Marvin, crusty old Marvin, taught me Tai Chi with the patience he had when he knew someone took that art seriously. I did, having to learn it, then learn it again and again, since I was older than anyone, since I was never a dancer or athlete whose body remembers whatever is shown once or twice. Marvin said that Confucius said, some people learn after one or two tries. Others take many, but everyone ends up knowing the very same thing. Marvin stood with me, holding my elbow when I nearly tipped over trying to lift my right leg, turn it a little, set it in place, lift my left leg, turn it. Such easy moves, but failure for me. Yet I did make small progress, and again more small progress until I could do Yang-style long form with the others. When I'm asked about my religion, I say I'm a Christian Jungian Taoist. The Tao is because Marvin taught me Tai Chi, turning a leg one way and then the other. Since Marvin has died, I found a prayer that is Buddhist because Marvin said he was that more than anything else. In the prayer, there's a wish for us to be sorrowless. When I think of the deer who once dashed through the grass where we practiced Tai Chi, its marvelous grace, its animal strength, I think I can move more towards sorrowlessness, accepting what I am given, slow progress or smooth, leaping joy. Our next reader is Phoebe McAdams. Thank you right. for a marvelous reading, Jim. Thank you. Mother of us all, one, year two, part two. I always like the sunshine on the houses across the street, Harry says, early New Year's morning. I do too, craftsman style, wood construction, well-porched houses where their owners have settled in like those sturdy bushes fronting the porch's length. The beginning year helps us reconsider. Kathleen tells me calm, had a damaged cover, so she bought joy. She gave me love, each day a quote from a better soul than mine. I could never think of 365 messages of love set down to inspire, encourage, make me more loving. Although I've been loved, my mother listened to me without judgment. My first best friend taught me how to laugh at Ogden Nash's silly verse. In fifth grade, my teacher came to my ballet recital, surely a ridiculous parade of little girls in wobbly slippers. Then she wrote a thank you note. Okay, these are my inclusions in my year long book. You can call them love or joy or calm or anything you please. Harry calls it sunshine on steady houses. As I grew up, my mother let me sneak dabs of her perfume. I bought her white lilac for birthdays. She bought herself white shoulders, knowing more about the body's pleasure than I could quite imagine. Our mother showed us how to shave our legs, buy bras, wash monthly blood out of our panties with cold soap. We ate Campbell's soup, homemade pies, Aunt Jeanette's black walnuts from her tree for cakes and cookies. I believed movie musicals were grown up life I could expect. America was perfect as it was, except for everything we didn't see in movies or in our public, quite all Christian school. Separation of church and state, not at Hartley Elementary, where the Christmas play rated as a big event. One year, I wore my mother's sequin rich green formal, hemmed. I was a noble woman bearing gifts to baby Jesus, whose manger was in Hartley's auditorium. I was cautioned to walk slowly, nobly. Whatever nobly was, it was uncomfortable. 
I had requested a classic sweatshirt, gray for Christmas. I rode my fast bike anywhere I pleased until I felt my body weaken every menstrual month, until I fell onto my bed, stared out the window, wondered what had happened. There wasn't pain, just puzzling melancholy, lack of energy to get my bike out of the garage, pedal to the local park and back. My beautiful Marin Schwinn bicycle, my closest relative, until my hormones took its place. I had little bras covering the body's secrets. Being a woman meant being a secret, hidden in modest underwear and loose wool sweaters. I bought dressy shoes with one inch heels as high as I could walk in. I took a class in ballroom dancing. I wasn't having fun, but taking step after step into deeper silence. The line between me and everybody else, permanent blue ink from a fountain pen I cherished, carried with me every day, back and forth to junior high. A pen became my bicycle. If this new year starts with girlhood, it progresses in its second week to rain, release from five year drought, sloshy tires against the pavement out on Mariposa Avenue, ardent rhythms matching my CD, which pl plays Hildegard Bin von Bingen's chants, sung reverently by four devoted women, medieval specialists harmonizing in St. Ursula's hard story of virgin martyrdom. She refused to marry any pagan, even a prince. Maybe Ursula missed out on romance, or maybe she went straight to heaven. Powerful faith deserves respect, as rain deserves our reverence, deserves religious gratitude. Anybody who complains should just shut up. We need this more than we need dying trees. The dead grass lawns. With rain, the yards across the street, fallow, spiceless brown, have burgeoned into Irish green, a green that sings along with worship. Here comes another car, splashing amen. Two, I'm alerted to a TV show defining God the conclusion, consciousness survives after these present lives. Last night, sleepless, I turned in bed, wondering about this possibility. Then I heard my mother's voice. She said, I'm with you. These words have never come to me before, completely audible, re repeated several times. She died in 1954. Has she been waiting alert until she knew my friend had said consciousness survives? I slept a little, not the whole night through, but enough to get me into mourning. Three, Harry brings home roses with the yogurt and the toilet paper and the walnuts. Red, red, red. These flowers set in water, accompanied by greenery, now on our table in the place we keep for lovelinesses. Quan Yin, goddess of compassion, meditates with a Cambodian wooden Buddha in our living room, a corner where some sacred objects gather, including an orange pumpkin from the fall, which keeps its freshness next to Mr. Buddha, as I address him every morning. Quan Yin, great mediator with her patient strength may save us if we let her, if we keep ourselves attentive to her myth. When Kuan Yin reached the gates of paradise, she heard the cries of suffering people, so she returned to earth. She gave up eternal something beautiful for us. Her little statue has its place right next to Mr. Buddha. Harry said last night, as we both fell asleep, adios day. <laughs> this new morning 
He asks to warm my clothes over our floor heater, which he does for his own shirt and pants. We see nothing but politics grinding away on TV. There's fear in friends' voices as they give reports on Donald Trump, new president, on our country's horrible divisions. I think of Anna Akhmatova, banned from Russia's approved list of poets in poverty, in anguish for her son's imprisonment, speaking her poems to friends who memorized her lines until it was safe to write them down again. Lucky us, so far, we are warming our clothes, taking our baths, watching TV. Thousands and thousands last weekend marched in the streets for women's rights, for our immigrants, for the natural world, for little knit hats, keeping their ears from the chill. <clears throat> I marched through the 60s with that era's causes and slogans, anti-war, pro-civil rights. I haven't forgotten that nothing is solved. There's a new democracy de documentary, I Am Not Your Negro, James Baldwin's life. Here he is again in front of me, reminding me how ignorant I am, because always because I'm white. I'm angry too, James Baldwin, with anybody thinking that I'm wrong to be exactly what I am, what I can't change, to be a woman, to have an old infertile body. I don't own houses or a business, a portfolio with thick investments. We live here in East Hollywood, which a restaurant critic once described as a decaying neighborhood. She should have seen that we are Latino, Filipino, Peruvian, white, African-American, Armenian, Frank, a handyman for our apartments is Russian. When I told another handyman that Frank's repairs tend to be industrial strength, but ugly, Ruby said, Soviet Union. Frank had sense enough to leave that stifling regime. Here in East Hollywood, I'm the lucky old lady at 1256 North Mariposa Avenue with the enormous metal shower head. Thank you, Frank. <laughs> Thank you, Phoebe, for that wonderful reading. I already have two lemons. I think I've asked that two more be delivered. What's delivered? A bag full stuffed with yellow lemons. How can I make use of these? So many ripe lemons, so many, many lemons. Oh wait, I remember someone wise telling me about too many lemons from a tree. I like to put them in a bowl and look at them. Natural beauty, not always to be used, but to be admired. Plump lemons piled in a bowl, lemons just to look at. I have two more dreams of gifts to go with the lemons, the many, many lemons. I sort through soaps I have, deciding what I need to buy. Then just behind me, I see new bars, delicious smelling soaps, the ones I love. Where have these come from? Then the final dream. I check a pile of panties in my drawer, relishing the clean pairs, thinking that I have enough, although no woman ever has enough of favorite panties. And yes, suddenly right next to these, I find a new stack of exactly the kind of panties I have bought for years. Who has put them there? Who knows what I want so intimately? Awake, I write the dream, and as I write, I realize only my mother would give me sun yellow fruit in winter, then fine soap along with panties. Nobody else would think to place in this one drawer my mother obviously has been collecting evidence of all the years she and I have been apart. February hinge, which gestures winter into spring. Not yet, not quite, but
But wind today sweeps the world brain clean. Spring is never simply purple iris. It brings with it birth pangs, prehistoric, fetal growl, growl mammalian throb, those swollen breasts. A man walks on our roof. He lops off overhanging branches from the Chinese elm nobody can stop. Elm roots tangle through our pipes, make our toilet sink and tub, a mess of sewage. Above us, branches cram themselves across the roof, scraping claws, unwilling to give up until they're cut, then piled along the dry walkway, chopped into smaller pieces, finally taken to the trash. The tree remembers, though, how to make its branches and invasive roots. I see we have just four more February days before we're into March, month of the vernal equinox. Nature's fate combined with ours, good or evil, whichever runs along the psychic path, the future path. Children shouted laughter now outside our house, could be long wail, loud keening for their tiny past, five or six or seven years they've lived, furnished themselves with memories, learned to write their swift identities across the top of any paper, given them to hold their names, not let go. Once we know our names, our private fate can find us. A man once said to me, women smell like olives. My menstrual blood carried the taste of iron. Why not be earth's flesh, olive salt and brine, iron strength? March, sacred to Mars, our necessary strength, iron in the blood in this month's stone, bloodstone, symbolizing courage. I take my courage from my history. Once I cried as I watched junior high school friends wave and wave jump up and down until the train was too far down the track for me to see them. I cried as long as I could cry. Then I forgot the friends, the house I lived in all my life, forgot our vacant lots, Catalpa tree, my secret lilac bush, the Civil War sword in our basement belonging to my own great grandfather's courage, not to mine. For the time I needed courage, years, I lost the gift of crying. In ancient Rome, this month began the year. It carries spring, of course, everything's beginning. The gods are cruel, the gods are kind. What will it be today? This painting on my wall, dark blood red with something like the sun beyond it, blood mixed with light, today's first given. My thought a year ago, Sometimes the best I can do is shut up. I write this as birds were swooping into spring. Birds, throats strong and whistling, everyday birds swooning, ecstatic. Music that verges on Lent, sacrifice, dying, then miracle. Lumina, blue letters, painted across the side of a white van going by. Blue sky, white humming clouds, a van made of paint and sky, finishing March harshness. Harry lights a white candle in front of my breakfast. With a candle, you're never alone, he tells me. His love is always a mother as well as a lover to me. Interlude. I'd left the family dinner to go outside. I loved my mother and father. The aunt, uncle, and cousins gathered the dinner table but suddenly I had to get away. Shivering in the early spring Nebraska weather where patches of snow still lay on the ground, trying to melt but having a hard time of it, I headed for the alley that separated our house and yard from the Saunders directly across from us. I walked looking down, watching my step, not sure where I was headed, then in the middle of the alley, lifting from a muddy pile of snow, I spotted a cluster of bachelor buttons. Their blue was a vivid purple blue, surprising and beautiful in the steadily darker evening. I knelt in the snow to look at the flowers, their ruffled petals like fragile wings. Even at age 10, 
I understood the moment, nature's ascendance out of winter's dormancy. This was proof of God, no doubt about it. I told no one. My family and I shared a mild version of Protestant Christianity, benign enough, but our congregational church never satisfied me. Divine revelation and a common flower would have made no sense in a religion of memorized prayer, solid good works. In college, I lost my religious faith completely. Our snowy alley had nothing to do with passing Latin literature in translation. On my small college campus, there was art though, theater, painting, music, poetry. The art seemed to me a world of soul. How to join that world? I couldn't. I thought I had no gifts large enough to offer soul. <laughs> 10 years later, I fell from my Phi Beta Kappa rationality into emotional exhaustion. What gathered as despair became my gift to the bachelor buttons. To find my own religion, I had to live within my dream life, within my true love of writing, my pull toward myth, symbology, archetypes, alchemy, prehistoric origins. I didn't find the answer, but the mystery, the sustaining mystery. Bachelor buttons are reseeding annuals, returning every spring. Once, a long time after my vision in the alley, I wrote in a poem of mine, I am returned to what I never left. And now Allison Townsend from Wisconsin. Harry asked me to read from some of Holly's earlier poems. So I, I've got to confess, I just went through and I picked some of my favorites. It was really hard to narrow it down. Can you hear me okay, everybody? Lemon seed. Impossible to pick it up. The oily outer coating catches on the kitchen counter and begs to grow, even where there's no soil. The ones I did manage to plant lived for three years. Never trees, but the fat leaves could be rubbed for odor and pleasure. There are ways to live that have nothing to do with righteousness, only with the urge to persist. I have no imagination these days, though I see what's close by to look at. The palm in my living room is beginning to scatter its spores. I sweep them up. They escape to farther corners than I can reach. It occurs to me that the first step in loving someone else is to love something slippery. I think Holly wrote really beautifully about girlhood and um, this poem, though written many, many years before the bachelor buttons, um, sort of feels related to it. <clears throat> How it does happen. One spring when I was learning to drive, when I was half awake to leaving home forever, a girl, more than a girl, but without a sex of her own, all tears, only learning to drive, to look out for things. One spring, I took the car, the gray Chevrolet, away from the afternoon, away from school, into some part of town. I forget, I have forgotten so much. Those years are still salt running on my tongue. I took the car, shifting gears, learning, and then stopped. It was someone's swampy place with trees. All I remember is moisture, the sponge of moss pressed under my feet. Did I take off my shoes? Wherever I was, I was alone. Violets grew under the tree in great clumps. In great purple clots, they were more blood than I had ever felt from the paws of boys 
from the thumbs of my own tears. Violets as moist as I hoped I would be sometime. Wet lavender, the odor of surrender. I had been trained to know verbs, but not how to act from my heart. And here were violets. I picked them, my hands shuddering. I picked more than I could carry, more than was fair. I picked them and dropped them and held them until I could sing all the way back, violets wilting in the seat beside me. Listeners to the popular song, to the growth of new crying, I suddenly knew that nature can be counted on when we are really lost. What I stole and killed that afternoon came into the stem of what I would be able to give later, what would feel like the reason, what I would not cry about, all the petals of blood living their lives through me. I lie next to you now. It's late at night. We're happy. We can't sleep. You ask me what the world is. I tell you a funny list of things. The last event is your mouth. In the darkness, I do not mention violets, but I lift myself on one elbow and lean to your face, my breast against your arm, so that I can say my mouth, your mouth, moist after all these years. One of my favorite books by Holly is Specific Mysteries. So I'll read a few poems from there. This particular poem, I remember Holly once learned some typesetting and she typeset this poem. I have a little typeset version of it. Some of the others probably do too. Rises in the evening, more daylight. The room fills with a weaving from Peru, its natural dyes, its lavenders, uneven and beautiful, which is my planning the last letter I'll ever write. Then my hand to my face to remind me of stubbornness. This face, it is a visit from a stranger, a visit from a sister. I give up the story that I was a happy child black wool diamond in the center with a stripe through it like sudden rain. Pure grace, but paid for over and over. If anything is to be whole, is to be colors purged from insects, squeezed from plants, applied to thread, combined with other thread, worked then finished. Hour after hour, shape and weight and length the handfuls of what I might have lived, what I do live. When someone says, you're so serious, I think, not serious enough. There are so many imitations. Words to live by. I know how much Holly loved Halloween, so I, I wanted to read the October poem in Specific Mysteries. <clears throat> Folk tale. Nothing has ever belonged to me, but what I've called loss returns as souls. October teaches me its first day in the death of my young friend. Five years ago, her tumored hands failing, shaking. When we talked, we talked of breath deeply, more deeply, breathe more deeply, then breath was gone but not her myth of cures. October, someone has planted zinnias in a bathtub in a parking lot. Someone has learned the exquisite hardship of sanity. Spirits everywhere, not waiting for spring, but here they come unmasked. I read a Russian woman's life her friends memorized her poems when it was too dangerous to write them down. My own Nordic ancestors set harps in their graves, 
ladders to the next world. The first day of October, I follow the twigs cracking, laying their patterns right under my feet. A friend tells me she has a good idea. A friend tells me she's found one laugh in the middle of an argument. A friend tells me he has lived through a meaningless war. A friend tells me a child has been born at home. Another friend tells me nothing, but just hearing her voice convinces me to give up hunching my shoulders for the relief of saying, all the poets, all the friends, all the dead, who are not the withered dead, but new. They forgive death. They know they have helped. Deeply, more deeply, breathe more deeply. The endless exchange, the endless inheritance. Take a risk. Nuts split. Their meat falls in its pieces. Small lamps from the bonfire where the masks are burned. for Poets in Autumn. I think this is maybe my most favorite poem that Holly ever wrote. I don't know, I have so many favorites. <laughs> for Poets in Autumn. Roses become their concentrated shells, carriers of seed. Lorca, Neruda, Akhmatova. The dead we see, the dead who see us, in this country where nothing ends, the birthmark on all our mouths, the slow mirror a bond. Why go on except for such a family? One more short one from, from this book. Um, the, the little dedication is for the women I love. Our life together. We are always daughters, our mother's dead, young and younger than we will ever be. How can I break the skin with words? Forest and ocean, dream it. That's the only definition. Mother at our own breasts, these islands, their lamps full of oil. The daughter listens. Slow, slow, generously slow music. I wanted to close with two poems from Esperanza, Poems for Orpheus. They both seem to me to just embody the creative process that, that Holly lived so deeply. The tall upheaving one. The cypress I pray to, it can fly. Nothing is a single species. We're made of bark, then avalanche. Orpheus can make us anything, can make us God's own door, cypress or oak or black, to be accepted there across the boundary as when I leave the house this morning, walking, nothing painful in my legs. I tell misunderstanding, this is our last year together. Then I see, just up the street, that planets are our bodies, their mouths slam through my wrists. I was a child who practiced jumping from the top of anything right into the air. Music was a swirl of vines and leaves that left my throat. I'm calling and I'm waiting and I'm called to. This black, the pure unknown, which finds its way exactly like the song we can't get rid of, the one I start with now and won't give up, the God obsessed with worship that is memorized, abiding, until the prayer itself moves inside out, converts these words of sliding rock to fragrance. I'm calling and I'm calling and I'm called. 
and then the title poem from Esperanza. Esperanza. I remember the night when we pulled at our roots, when we drank all the water then sang. We were beautiful trees. We were roads to the next simple town. They had waited for us, both the people and stars. We were made into hymns. Nobody wrote them, but no one forgot. And then we weren't trees anymore. We were families of sparks. You will be the next. You will be you and then not. Thank you, Allison. Thank you, Jim. And thank you, Phoebe. And thank you all who came and attended this. Since we have like three or four minutes left and we just have to be attentive to time, I will just ask the readers if they would just take like maybe um, 30 or 40 seconds, a, a minute at most, just to talk about the first time that you met Holly and uh, how did you meet her? And I will just begin. I, I read her piece, which is poetical autobiographical fiction. And it just, I, I fell in love with her writing. And in that writing, there was great interweaving as it, there is in weather. There's also uh, a tremendous affection for women and also love for community. And then I met her and we started going together. And I could go on, but let's go to Allison next. How did you meet her? And then we'll go to Phoebe and then Jim. I, I met Holly when, with great fear and trepidation, I drove from Claremont into Los Angeles for a six-week workshop she was teaching at the Women's Building in LA. I think it was probably 76 or 77 when I, and she actually, she read that that little piece, Lemon Seed. It was the, it was the first thing I ever heard her read. And I walked into the room and, and I just, I mean, it was like, oh, this is poetry. <laughs> it was, it was, it was life transforming, of course, but, but I still remember her reading Lemon Seed. It was just, it was wonderful. Phoebe? Yeah. You know, I can't remember when I first met Holly. I feel like she's always been part of my life. Um, I mean, she was, I, I, I don't remember when I first met her, but I went to the, I went to her workshops for 25 years at, you know, every other Wednesday. And so she was this great root that went through my life. And, you know, I've compared her, her relationship with the women in her workshops to the pando. You know, the pando is this enormous grove of trees, um, but it's really one tree because it's all connected <laughs> and it's root. And I feel like all over Los Angeles, there's this, we're, we're connected in our roots because of the work we've done with Holly and that our soul is this enormous pando. Mm -hmm. Thank I think it was 1985. We may, we, I think we saw you read up with Judy Oberlander's uh, at, at, the, at the library. At the library. Yeah, and we, and we have about one minute, just less than a minute, Jim. So please just uh, be aware of time because there's a program at two. So when did you first meet her, Jim Cushing? I, I, my first encounter with Holly Prada was in the pages of Baki magazine. Oh, yes. I read some of her poems. Uh, and then uh, a, a, a month or so after that, I met her along with you, Harry, at Papa Bach Bookstore. And, and I, I remember shaking hands with both of you and introducing myself and, uh, and, 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 uh, and, and, and praising uh, your work. And, and Holly smiled and said, thank you very much. And I, and I saw that sparkle in her eye. There are also women here who knew uh, Holly before we did, Barbara Crane among others. And uh, they're all a blessing, all of you women who have studied with Holly and your superlative writing. Judy Oberlander, obviously, she met her, I know, at the women's building. Holly, okay, it's two o'clock. We have to uh, turn this over to Jennifer Clymer. Thank you all. Wonderful reading. Thank you all for uh, joining us today. Here's Jennifer Thank you. Clymer. Thank you guys so much. Um, it was a real honor. And although Holly was not with us on the campus for very, very long, she made an impression upon all of us, and it was beautiful to honor her in this way today. Thank you.